Hi, everyone. Uh, we'll be convening for the next uh, session right now. Um, and I just wanted to give a brief introduction as we convene for the session, uh, which is entitled Public and Financial Sector Climate Risks and Responses and Their Macroeconomic Implications. The reason that we set up this section uh, after the one before is just the recognition that the climate crisis is already affecting many aspects of our economy. And one way we're seeing this happen is, for example, in the way insurance markets are reacting uh, to extreme climate risks. We've seen very recently uh, two major insurance companies say they will not offer any new policies in California because of the rise in catastrophic wildfire risks specifically. Uh, this insurance reaction is kind of a canary in the coal mine because these risks are actually there in many places in our economy. The market for the large part is not fully capturing this signal. It is still flying under the radar, uh, but the physical risk from the climate science perspective is very, very clear. So for example, on wildfires, the signal around increasing wildfire risks in the Western United States has been clear for at least a decade, if not longer. Of course, that science is getting uh, ever more dire, but the signal was already there. It was just not being translated into the market yet. And that is a really cautionary tale for us because this kind of a risk flying under the radar exists in many places in our economy. And they might individually look like micro risks to specific sectors, but they will add up to a substantial risk to uh, the stability of our economy overall. And just as a few examples, we've got trillions of dollars of real estate uh, all around our nation that are in areas that are flood prone and wildfire prone. Those risks are increasing substantially because of human caused climate change. Um, and they're accelerating in many cases, like in the case of sea level rise, uh, we have extreme precipitation events that are also uh, making flooding worse, uh, hotter, drier conditions, fueling catastrophic wildfire seasons that in some places are now becoming year round. Um, we also have a substantial risk to public health from a range of climate impacts, whether it's uh, the smoke from wildfires uh, or extreme heat, which takes a terrible toll, mortality and morbidity, especially on people who have to work outdoors. So there are real labor implications of this. And there are huge equity implications of these climate risks as well, which often when you aggregate the impacts and look at it from a macroeconomic perspective, you can sometimes lose the fact that there are uh, big parts of our population that are ex especially exposed to these risks because of longstanding socioeconomic and racial disparities in our country. So uh, in this section here, what we wanted to do was highlight some, uh, some of these risks with uh, the idea that we can start to appreciate that while they might look like individual sectoral risks right now, we have to get out ahead and make sure that we're preparing because this is coming for us in a much larger uh, way. And uh, specifically, the, what, one of the things that we want to uh, point out in this section is for the large part, our response has been a disaster response, a reactive response, uh, rather than a proactive recognition that we have to be thinking about climate resilience in a more holistic way because it is going to affect so many people and so, so many parts of our country. Um, so we have three excellent panelists today, and we're going to start with Laura Backinson, who's an associate professor at the University of Arizona School of Government and Public Policy. She utilizes applied microeconomic and econometric techniques to study the economics of natural disasters, identifying current and future risks, and evidence of adaptation to damages and fatalities across the globe. Laura? Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and it's been a, a wonderful discussion thus far. Um, so I, I'd like to review... Uh, three uh, of my own papers, just as kind of examples of this, the spirit of this work and the questions that are being asked. So next slide, please. So first, um, and if you'll indulge me, um, a little outside the scope of particularly this panel, but I think very relevant for the conversations we've been having uh, yesterday and today, um, uh, I uh, the the importance really of kind of bridging this micro macro gap or how can we take the rich results, for example, from the third panel yesterday and uh, better incorporate them into macroeconomic models. 
So there is uh, good work doing this, um, but one uh, one of my own uh, papers looking at this is, is joint with Lint Barrage at ETH Zurich. Um, and we were looking at, um, we were motivated by kind of this rich uh, theoretically, uh, uh, sorry, rich empirical literature um, examining the impact of natural disasters and climate risks on economic growth. Um, and noting that there sometimes were divergent findings or findings in tension with each other. Um, and also there could sometimes be more limited connection with macroeconomic theory and limited integration in macro climate economy models. So we thought there was a lot of um, important opportunity both to inform these models and also um, uh, increase the richness of the, the climate economy models as well. So um, one of the insights that, that we followed was instead of uh, looking at the impact of natural disasters, so we take the case of tropical cyclones and look at the impact of that on growth and use that to project climate change, uh, we instead um, use uh, empirical evidence of the, the um, modeling the structural determinants of growth. Um, we could then use kind of the rich uh, portfolio of, of data available and directly uh, 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 insert these findings into a stochastic uh, endogenous growth cycle and climate economy model, which is exactly what we do. Uh, we have a modified version of work from Tom Krebs um, incorporating the risks of cyclones. Um, and one of the one of the benefits of this is that we could then kind of directly import these um, kind of rich uh, empirical findings into the model um, and and find what difference that makes. Um, so we actually find that. Um, it, uh, it, it can help to inform both literatures, um, having a structural lens for the microempirical, more reduced form literature um, can help inform empirical specification and interpretation. So for example, seemingly innocuous um, decisions and modeling, for example, um, operationalizing a, a climate risk, so uh, tropical cyclones by you know, the, the damages they cause versus the um, wind speed, this actually maybe uh, would be identifying or track back to different parts of this underlying growth equation, um, and therefore tensions and findings across empirical literature may not be so much intention, and in fact, just, just looking at um, different parts of this overall equation. Um, we also note that there are sometimes um, uh, that one of the benefits for macrostructural literature um, is again we can more directly integrate um, these very careful, thoughtful, um, uh, empirically grounded findings um, and uh, and bring that richness into the macro um, literature um, to be able to you know uh, make these uh, uh, findings and and uh, models more. Um, uh, more connected with, with the, the world. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, more at, at um, in light of what we were thinking about for today's panel, um, uh, there's important, an important question is to what extent climate risks are um, uh, impacting or um, occurring in financial markets. So um, in current work with Tuan Fan and, and Russell Wong at the Richmond Fed, uh, we wanted to look um, specifically at the impact of climate risk in the collateralized death, death, debt market. Um, and to do so, we build a new uh, model, um, uh, extension of a model to look at um, uh, debt um, in with under belief heterogeneity. So an important um, area, and I think this was picked up in the previous panel as well, is, is heterogeneity or disagreement in beliefs sur surrounding climate change. We see this very evident in the United States as well. Um, typical um, collateralized debt market work by Gina Coppolis, Simsek, et cetera, um, will commonly find that optimists are more likely to pay more for the asset, a risky asset, and also more likely to leverage. Uh, we extend uh, the traditional model into an infinite time horizon, which allows for heterogeneity in maturity of the debt contracts, and actually find that this reverses this finding. Um, and in fact, pessimists uh, we find to be theoretically and also empirically using the case of sea level rise, um, it, using a large scale data set from the uh, for more than a decade of uh, home sales along the eastern seaboard in the United States. Uh, we find pessimists actually to be more likely to leverage. Um, and for longer maturity uh, debt contracts. Why is this the intuition being? Um, now, while nobody would hope to default on a mortgage contract, um, the default channel actually theoretically allows um, for some implicit insurance and can act potentially as an insurance to um, potential incomplete insurance markets surrounding some of these climate risks. So as we know, um, in flood uh, for flood risk, this is uh, primarily 
overwhelmingly public insurance market through the national flood insurance per, uh, market in the in the case of the United States. Um, but there can be limits um, to uh, there are limits to um, coverage of about two hundred fifty thousand dollars per property. Um, so this could lead uh, implicitly to some supply side constraints. Uh, policies are typically only for a year or in, in, a, in uh, a few cases, just a few years, um, which um, does wouldn't help with these long-term um, climate risks that may be on um, decadal timescales. Um, and um, so also important um, is uh, highlighting that better climate information, people being attentive to climate risk may not necessarily mean that um, uh, potential concentration of climate risk in financial markets will be solved. So in this case, with additional attention to climate risk, we may actually anticipate more, more individuals taking out mortgages potentially. Um, there also is a critical role of policy in this story. We find that this, um, uh, this uh, channel with pessimists leveraging more, um, one of the questions is if everybody knows that these um, these assets are at risk, why not just price that in? Um, and we find, and actually building on previous work by um, uh, Amin Ozad, Matt Kahn, and others, um, the important role of government-sponsored enterprises. Um, currently, uh, through policy, um, including some, some um, policy constraints, uh, uh, these types of crime risks aren't currently priced into their uh, pricing of securitization uh, of these uh, mortgage uh, portfolios. Uh, therefore, banks may be could potentially be theoretically fully attentive to these risks, but knowing that they may be able to securitize and pass on riskier loans to, um, for example, GSEs, um, then they could act as if they um, uh, are less concerned about these climate risks. Um, and so we find empirically that um, this result, this kind of pessimistic channel, um, is, is almost entirely found within the conforming loan segment that could be securitized to the GSEs. Um, so I think this is just a highlight as to um, the role of climate risk in the financial market. Um, I think this is a, a really important area for um, continued work, um, as there are a lot of unanswered questions, um, and also the interaction between public policy and uh, collateralized debt markets and all other financial markets, um, and importantly, also the role of belief heterogeneity and how uh, the role of climate information um, is certainly a critical and necessary component in, in uh, solving some of these uh, uh, risks, uh, but uh, potentially insufficient, especially if um, coupled with other uh, uh, policies as well. Uh, final slide, please. Um, and so uh, I'll dig a little bit more into public insurance, because um, I think that this is a really, uh, or uh, insurance um, uh, around public, uh, sorry, climate risks in general. Um, in the case of flood insurance, of course, this is a primarily public insurance product, but we know that across other climate risks, um, the, the private market is is um, it is very active. Um, so in a paper with Lala Ma, we looked at uh, sorting over flood risk. So I know the issue of migration um, had come up. We look uh, just within metropolitan area sorting here, uh, but the idea that people may move uh, heterogeneously. Um, and in fact, we find unlike um, you know, common um, thoughts that high flood risk areas will be primarily white or high income, which we do find consistent with our case in South Florida. Um, uh, for coastal flood risk, inland flood risk, we find to be a very, very different story where low income Black and Hispanic residents are more likely to move into harm's way in part because prices are lower, all else equal. Uh, we then can use this structural sorting model to examine counterfactual price reforms to the National Flood Insurance Program. These are not the current risk rating 2.0 reforms, but there could be important parallels. Um, and we find that since uh, there is this heterogeneous sorting, certain groups may be less likely to move out of harm's way given the increase in prices. So in our, our uh, predicted um, counterfactual results, we find, again, these low-income Black and Hispanic residents are would be more likely to bear the costs of uh, these costly um, price reforms. Again, there's many reasons why we may want to be undertaking the price reforms, but um, an important flag that there could be unintended consequences that could have disproportionate burden on, on more vulnerable groups that are already in harm's way. Um, just a last final thought, as I know I'm almost out of time, um, I think there, this is really highlighting, uh, you know, conversations we've already been having about um, market, in, potential market incompleteness in insurance markets um, and the role of, you um, uh, state-run flood insurance markets um, and, and uh, you know, public insurance markets that will be kind of stepping in to um, take, take on the role when the private market may be shying away from some of these areas. Um, so I'll stop there, uh, but thank you. Look forward to the discussion.
Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, the next we have up is Daryl Fairweather. She is the chief economist of uh, Redfin, the real estate uh, company, where she leads economic research about the housing market. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to see you all. I am in Wisconsin right now, and there is a moderate amount of wildfire smoke lingering above me. So it's a great day to talk about climate change and the impacts on how we live. Uh, I'm the chief economist at Redfin. Like, like you said, I, am, I lead the economic research team for the benefit of our executives, our agents, and also our customers. Next slide. So I'm gonna be talking a bit about the research that we've done on climate change. We got climate change data onto our website and, and app uh, late 2020. We did an experiment with it and then it went well and we decided to launch all kinds of climate change measures down to the individual home level. So from First Street Foundation and from Climate Check, we have data on all different kinds of climate risks. And if you could look up your home, you can see exactly what your individual projected risk is. Uh, next slide. We did some research into where Americans are building homes based on this data that we have. And we found that increasingly homes are getting built in riskier areas, especially for fire risk. So in the first half of the 20th century, uh, only 14% of homes were being built in fire risky areas. And now that is up to 55%. Uh, we are certainly making you know, climate change worse in terms of the impact on housing, just in terms of our building patterns. Uh, next slide. And, and this is happening uh, because of encroachment into fire risky areas. So you can see here, um, or not fire risky areas, climate risky areas. This is a map for drought. There are other maps that kind of show the same pattern, but in Phoenix in particular, you can see that the building has happened in places with higher drought risk. And recently Phoenix even announced that they were gonna start limiting building because of the strain on water that building is having. Uh, but you know, there are other things that draw on water. It's obviously not just housing, they're agricultural uses of water, but they are stepping forward with limiting housing. Next slide. Uh, so on top of the fact that people are building homes in places that are risky, people are moving to those homes. I mean, that makes sense where there is supply, demand will usually be there too. Uh, and you can see that people are, are moving to the places with some of the highest climate risks. Uh, in Florida in particular, you know, there's all kinds of risks, heat, flood, storm. Uh, and Florida has been one of the top migration destinations for home buyers. Uh, right now, we, we look at where people are moving and uh, when they're leaving their, met, their metro area based on Redfin data we have on uh, where people are located based on their IP address. And we've identified people who are searching in one metro area and looking to move to another. And in that data, five out of the top metros that people are moving to when they're moving out of state are located in Florida. And then you can see other places too that kind of fit this pattern like inland California. Um, and then people are leaving some of the less risky places like the Midwest and the Northeast. All right, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about an experiment that we did when we first launched climate change data on the Redfin website. So on the Redfin website, you can find all kinds of information about a home, pictures, uh, the specifications, number of bedrooms, walkability is a data that we've had for a long time, school quality. And we put this down on the site because we think when people are looking for a home, they're gonna wanna know also about the neighborhood and also you know things about the individual home. And we have limited real estate per se when it comes to what we put on the site. So we weren't positive we wanted to add climate change data. We weren't sure if it was gonna be something useful to our customers. So when we first did it, we did a three month long experiment where we only showed flood risk data to half of our customers. Uh, next slide. So here is the control view, the treatment view and the expanded treatment view. This is on the mobile app. You can see in the control view, there was no, uh, there was no tab for flood risk, but we added the tab for flood risk. And then you can click in and see all this different information about flood risk for each individual home. So it will look different for every single property Flood risk is one of those things where if you're at the top of the hill, you have less risk than if you're at the bottom of the hill. So it does vary uh, quite a bit. Uh, and yes, we added the site with this experiment lasting three months. Next slide. So what we found was that Redfin users who viewed homes with severe or extremely risky flood risk 
prior to the Redfin experiment ended up bidding on homes with 54% risk. It was a, it was like a one to 10 scale um, after gaining access to the risk data. So extremely risky or severely risky, I think it was like seven and above. And then they got homes, ended up with homes above about half that risk compared to people who were not exposed to the treatment at all. Redfin users in risky places like Cape Corral, Florida, Houston and Baton Rouge were most likely to click in and see the flood risk data. Makes sense. They're probably already somewhat knowledgeable about flood risk and would be interested in learning more. Uh, so one conclusion from this research is that, you know, if this were to, there's some kind of unpriced value of having a less risky home and that's not priced in. So over time, we will probably see home values in places with high risk, not appreciate as much as places with low risk. Next slide. Uh, this impact amplified over time. So you can see this is weeks since the user entered the experiment before no effect afterwards, a uh, pretty monotonic decline in terms of uh, the, the kinds of homes people were searching for with their flood risk. So at first, not much of an effect, but at the end of the experiment, a 25% decline overall in terms of the homes people searched for. We had two different outcome variables. We had uh, the types of homes people searched for just in terms of what they did on the app and the website. But because we are also a brokerage and we have agents that work with clients, we saw all the way through for a smaller share of the users. So like users, a lot of people are on the website, not many of them actually buy homes, a smaller share of them actually buy homes with Redfin, but for the ones that did, we were able to see the offer um, effect as well. So that's next slide, I believe. Um, oh wait, actually, I already addressed that. But anyway, the offer result was that uh, they, they people built, uh, been on homes with about half as much risk if they start off with severe or extreme risk. Uh, sorry, previous slide. Uh, this is just a another result. This is from a survey. So already. Uh, out of home buyer, out of home owners, 58% of them say they've spent money to protect their homes from climate threats. Right now, it's about a third of home are saying that home homeowners saying they've spent five thousand dollars or more to make their home more resilient to climate risk. I mean, that could be something simple like upgrading a roof or doing some landscaping to have water flow away from the home. But already, homeowners say that they're kind of they're, they've had to make some improvements because of the changes they've seen in their environment. It's just survey data, but it's interesting. Uh, extreme temperatures are the most common climate risk the homeowners uh, protect against air conditioning. That's obviously a good way to do that or insulation. And then followed by flooding and hurricanes. And 36% of homeowners say they have an insurance policy covering flooding, uh, which was the highest share. Next slide. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the policy implications. Uh, next slide. As discussed previously by Laura, it is most there's there's inequality in terms of who gets impacted by climate change and how able people are to respond. Wealthy people and corporations are probably the best able to protect themselves and their investments against climate change. Uh, but local and federal governments, uh, they may also have an incentive to protect their most uh, valuable assets, whether that's company like you know, like company buildings or uh, high high worth real estate. Uh, and then there's a question of who pays the damage from climate change. You know, it'll probably be felt by everyone, but the magnitudes will not be equal. Some lower income people tend to live in places with higher risks. Um, there's also historical inequality with redlining, where redline neighborhoods, which only black and brown people were allowed to buy homes in, or not were allowed to, but they ended up buying homes in, um, tend to have higher flood risks. And that's still where black and brown communities live. So that historical racist policy still might have some impact today on who gets hurt the most by climate change. And then there's a question of who is allowed to stay and who is forced to move. If governments invest in say the Hamptons, but they're not gonna invest in Alabama, then you know there's gonna be some inequality in terms of who gets the investment to stay and make the communities more resilient and who gets relocated. Um, but a lot of, yeah, marginal cost, marginal benefit, social planner problems to think about. <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> one more slide, I even forgot, 43 seconds. Uh, so what we can do is we can limit building in high risk places. Uh, this can be done by paying communities not to rebuild and to use the, and to maybe have that building go somewhere else to discourage movement into these high risk areas. 
We can eliminate single family zoning in low risk areas um, and other restrictive practices that limit dense housing. And we can also raise awareness about risk. I mean, the experiment pretty much showed that if you show people information about climate risk, they do respond to it. So it seems like we should be getting the word out and increasing the salience of that information. And doing it at the moment that someone is in the process of buying a home is probably a good way to go about it. All right, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And feel free to reach out with questions. My co-author on that paper, Rob Metcalf, will be presenting it at the Summer Institute for NBER. So you can see the full paper there. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, our next speaker is Yanjohn Penny Liao. She is an economist and a fellow at the Resources for the Future. And her work focuses on issues of natural disaster risk management and climate adaptation. Uh, she focuses on the impacts of disasters on government budgets, how disaster insurance interacts with the housing and mortgage sector, as well as the economic and fiscal impacts of adaptation policies on local communities. Everyone, um, thank you so much. Um, am I supposed to see a countdown clock somewhere? Oh yeah, I see it. Um, hi everyone, I am Penny Lau from Resources for the Future. My remark today will be focused on the implications of physical climate risk on local government finance. Next. I wanna focus on local governments because while climate change is a global problem, the physical risks are highly localized. The impacts of disasters related to climate and the decision to respond and adapt to disaster risk and climate risk are often made at the local level and it crucially depends on local government capacity. So when we think about the macroeconomic impacts of physical climate risk, it's important to understand how different localities are impacted by them and how they're dealing with them. So in this remark, I'm gonna first talk about multiple fiscal uh, stress pathways that disaster risk can put on local governments. And then I will talk about distributional issues. Uh, then I will talk about the potential to crisis, which is you know, overvaluation of housing in risky areas and insurance issues, which have been touched on summarized really nicely in the previous two remarks. Um, but I will talk about them in the context of local government finance. Next slide. So climate-related uh, disasters can affect local government finance in a multitude of pathways. And in this diagram, I tried to summarize some existing findings on these pathways, including uh, some of my papers looking at how wildfires, hurricanes, floods, and storms affect the various different components in local government budgets. In general, we find that disasters make uh, balancing the budget more difficult for local governments. This is primarily because of the need to increase spending on disaster recovery and adaptation. For example, after California municipalities are hit by a major wildfire event, we find that uh, they, on average, increase spending in community development by 40%. And there are also very large increases in public safety, transportation, and disaster preparedness. On the other hand, revenues do not tend to keep up, and, and rather, they tend to decrease after disaster. That's because disaster damage on properties reduce the community's tax base in the short run. And if people respond to disasters or disaster risk by migrating out of the community, then it would lead to a long run erosion of the property and sales tax base of the local government. Two additional funding mechanisms are important. Uh, sorry, still that on that slide. Yes, thanks. Uh, two additional funding mechanisms are important uh, when local governments are dealing with budgetary shortfalls from a disaster or when they want to invest in a major adaptation project and don't have uh, the cash. And so these are summarized in the white boxes. The first is municipal bonds. The ability to borrow at a low cost is important for local governments to smooth over any short run budget deficits. However, research has shown that uh, disasters tend to lower uh, municipal bond ratings for those communities that are hit and, and uh, increase borrowing costs. And so it could cause 
uh, liquidity issues going forward. The second funding mechanism is intergovernmental transfer. These mainly take the form of you know, a wide variety of disaster uh, assistance programs, disaster aid programs by the federal government. And we find that disaster increases intergovernmental transfer to local governments, which can be very helpful for them to fund some of the recovery needs. However, these transfers also re re represent a form of cross-subsidization from low-risk to high-risk areas, and, and they can raise equity concerns. Next, please. And here, I want to take a more systematic look at distributional issues. Um, it turns out that the average budgetary change that I just described lacks pretty important heterogeneity across uh, communities. In high-income counties, we see that there is um, a substantial increase in spending following disasters. But in low-income counties, we are not seeing much change. And this could suggest that low-income counties are either not able to spend that much on disaster recovery or they're cutting down on other services. Um, and when we look at revenues, we find that high-income counties are more able to raise revenues to fund the spending. Their tax revenues actually increase, and they get more intergovernmental transfers. And so overall, we also see that high-income counties' debt actually have a moderate decrease, whereas low-income counties are borrowing more. Um, one likely reason for these differences is that low-income counties are less able to absorb the disaster damage as they don't have the same kind of financial buffer, either the local government or uh, individuals. Um, they might not have the same ability to raise additional funds because of the underlying economy or housing market is less robust. Since we see a difference in intergovernmental transfers, there might also be some institutional factors at play. Uh, some recent studies have suggested that disaster aid programs or disaster declarations are set up in a way that might favor wealthier communities. Because of these differences in responses, um, in the coming years, we might see diverging trajectories for communities with different capacities. Um, this can exacerbate the existing divide between high and low income communities and can also have implications in terms of the spatial distribution of population and production, because you can imagine that the more robust um, higher income communities might stay in place and continue to grow, and the lower income communities might deteriorate in condition with more uh, out migration. Uh, next slide. Next, I want to switch gear and talk about potential surprises that are concerning. Uh, as the previous two remarks uh, uh, mentioned, um, a lot of the properties with uh, risk are potentially overvalued because of various mechanisms, uh, the disclosure laws, uh, lack of information, uh, socialization of disaster costs, subsidized flood insurance, et cetera. And so in a recent publication, we quantified uh, the overvaluation across US counties, and then we try to think about what it means for local public finance. Uh, and in this, and you can imagine that when these kind of overvaluation gets corrected, it could have major implications for particularly for those local governments that rely heavily on property tax revenues. And so in this uh, map, the darker the shade of yellow, the more dependent that county is on property tax revenue, and the darker the shade of purple, the more overvaluation there is in that county. And some of these darkest areas, which we outlined in red, uh, are, are counties that are most at risk of uh, overvaluation. Um, and if the overvaluation gets corrected, they might face pretty acute uh, decrease in uh, revenues and might have to come up with alternative um, ways of funding uh, services that they provide. Next. And then uh, insurance availability and affordability uh, issues are also rising. Uh, as we know, insurance is a critical source of funding uh, for homeowners to rebuild after a disaster. Um, we looked at wildfires um, 
is more 2015, and we see that actually wildfires are not um, impacting the property tax revenues in California that much. And one of the major reasons could be that at that time, um, wildfire damage is covered by regular homeowners insurance and the coverage rate is pretty high. And so homeowners have sufficient uh, resources to rebuild. However, this situation is changing as we know. And um, in this map, uh, it comes, it, this map actually comes from an issue briefly put out last year. And it shows you that in some of the zip codes that are at uh, the highest risk at wildfires, the insurer initiated non-renewal rate can go to 20 to 30%. And it is probably uh, increasing over time. And we see the same kind of story in Florida, Louisiana, Texas. And, it, and this trend could exacerbate the disaster insurance coverage gap which means that a lot of more and more homeowners might not have sufficient resources to rebuild, which might intensify the fiscal stress on local government because the um, impact on property tax base after a disaster might be larger. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Penny. And uh, we have about 20 minutes for some open discussion and uh, questions and answers here. So uh, folks, please do uh, use the raise hand function for those in the room and online if you have a question that uh, you would like to ask. Um, and uh, thank you so much to the speakers. So please stay online for the Q&A now. Bridget, is that something that you'll drop in here? <laughs> OK, great. Um, and while we're waiting for questions to come in on on uh, the the online format, uh, I I did have a question for for all of you from different perspectives. You're all highlighting a risk that is in some cases already here, um, already starting to see the leading edge of it, but clearly a big chunk of the risk still not being priced into the market. It also feels like a nationwide risk in, in many cases. It's not just isolated in certain places because of all the different climate risks. Um, so coming back to the theme of, of this workshop, which is to make the connection with the macroeconomic risk, how do you all see these threats uh, uh, flowing out to the macro economy, because it's obviously not just about individual homes, as you've said, it's the property tax base, it's a mortgage market, it's all of our retirement portfolios that might have real estate in it, um, budgets, local and uh, national government budgets, insurance. Um, so any and big picture thoughts about how we can start to uh, think about it from a macroeconomic pers perspective? Uh, I can speak to real estate just because in housing, housing is a really big part of the economy. And we're already seeing it show up in the housing market um, when it comes to insurers pulling out of California. I understand that that's partially because California is limiting the ability of those insurers to price in risk. Um, so there's a, a bit of a market mismanagement there, but it, I think it goes to show that there might there are things that are keeping the true risk from being felt by homeowners at this point, and that's only going to last so long because eventually insurers will put their foot down, and then after that happens, you know, can't get a if you can't get insurance, you can't buy a home with a mortgage. Um, so in housing, it's hard to say how big the effects are exactly, but they're probably going to be quite large uh, in terms of people having to spend more on insurance, uh, their water bill, upgrade, renovating their homes or having to relocate. All those things are expensive. And it's coming at a time when we already have a housing shortage. I think Freddie Mac has estimated we're about 4 million housing units short. Um, we're probably shorter if you account for the damage of climate change. So I think there's a big uh, reason to build more, especially in places that are naturally resilient to climate change. Yeah, no, I think that's really the big question. And I think that's really the frontier of a lot of research right now, seeing how these kind of local, regional, sectoral risks may scale up. Um, I think there's there's a few pieces. So first of all, just observing, quantifying, putting some numbers, you know, uh, being attentive to where these risks are found and how they're starting to interact. I think that's a key piece um, in order to be able to, you know, very much in the spirit of, of this uh, these discussions, how can we then incorporate them into broader macroeconomic models? Um, we know there are many um, to look at some of these different mechanisms and channels to what extent this will um, change 
you know, a firm or individual decision making in where to live or what to invest in, how much to save. Um, these could have reverberations, of course, for the broader economy. Um, I, I think there's, you know, increasing attention on kind of climate stress testing in some of these financial areas um, in order to see, um, because I think there's kind of two key areas here. One is the long run climate risk and how that's being incorporated, which can have very different dynamics than uh, individual climate events. Um, both are quite important um, in baguette different types of studies, uh, but understanding how these tail events um, could trigger um, you know, a, a correlation of um, uh, uh, sectors and, and uh, firms and individuals' homes um, to have, you know, all be shocked at the same time, um, then uh, I think that will add, you know, the, you know, how we adjust and account for the long run risk is one question, but also to what extent will tail events lead to kind of additional stresses. Um, I think these are all very active areas of research. And then third, of course, um, thinking about, I think we've all been kind of bringing up uh, policy interactions, right? So a lot of policy is very well intentioned, but thinking about where we may need to make amendments or corrections to policies that may be having unintended consequences um, to the extent that we can foresee them in advance, of course. Um, and I think that one of the themes that really come up in all of the remarks is, is that, yes, the, a lot of the risk is not priced in. And so there's a question of when and how the risk will be priced in and what does that mean uh, for the macroeconomy. And the other day I was in a wonderful conversation with some colleagues uh, on the Nature Climate Change paper. And we were talking about, you know, the transition in, in, in the um, energy uh, space. People talk about energy transition, but actually in this space there's a transition as well in terms of, you know, how the risk gets priced in. and the transition dynamics is really important for thinking about, you know, people's household welfare in this process. Um, if the risk suddenly gets spiked in, then we see, you know, a lot of the communities that is highlighted in red in, in that map, you know, they are going to see very acute uh, fiscal stress. And, and how do we prevent things like that happening? I think it's also uh, important. Thank you. And you all also highlighted the equity components of that transition risk and, and really paying attention to that. Um, so in the queue, we have Lars. Yes. Um, thank you. Very interesting session. Um, I have. I guess I have two two questions. The first one is, uh, is almost for Laura. I, I, I like very much the research that you're doing that's kind of, uh, that, that's looking at the heterogeneous of beliefs over duration under which these long run risks might be realized. I think that's a, a very uh, uh, interesting topic and you show some, you know, how, how that can change perspectives of, of, of pricing and financial markets and the like. On that, I had two type of robustness questions. Um, the first is, What's what's the market structure in the background in terms of other ways to hedge the uh, climate risk? Is there uh, and and how would that affect the pricing of uh, of, the, of these particular contracts? And um, and the second one I think is, given your models probably largely meant to be qualitative, may not be so important. But when I think about these long term risks, I really think of, I really like to think about them broader terms, but long term uncertainty. And so then this issue of how much confidence people have in those beliefs shows up, and that confidence itself could could spill over to uh, questions about valuation. Uh, the other one is for Penny. When I talk about overvaluation risk, I'm I'm kind of curious how you assess that in terms of people when they uh, purchase these homes are speculating about government interventions in the future, government bailout subsidies and the like. And, 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 and that's gotta be fact. And it seems like that could have a big, big impact on the valuation in some of these uh, vulnerable locations. Um, yeah, no, these are great questions. So um, it, at least in our, in our debt model, um, we have, we do include insurance as a, as a, as an area. Um, but again, I think there's an important question about the incompleteness of insurance and also substitutions across these types of um, channels to mitigate the risks, right? So if um, if somebody perceives that they have default as a channel, then, um, you know, that may, may make insurance less um, of interest to them. So in, we know a stylized fact for uh, flood insurance in the United States is take up is very low, despite having, um, uh, premiums that have historically on average been below actually fair prices. 
Um, but understanding through the lens of belief heterogeneity um, can uh, at least provide one um, area to reconcile this where you know, if people, if people are attentive to the risk, but are relying on other ways to um, uh, shoulder these risks or, or hedge them, then, uh, then insurance may look less appealing to them, especially if prices are rising. Um, and then, of course, if people are overly optimistic, insurance may also not look that appealing because the price will be high relative to the, the expected losses that they have. Um, so I, I agree. I think there's a lot more work to be done to look at kind of the, the portfolio of ways, uh, location decision, um, in situ adaptation and, and mitigation efforts, uh, both private and public, uh, insurance, uh, you know, uh, default, um, in, in how all of these kind of work in tandem or in substitution. Um, as you're mentioning also substitutes, substitution for expectations of post-disaster aid. Um, in reality, uh, household level aid is is fairly low, but I think, uh, but you know, people may overestimate this, um, and I think there's really an important role uh, for survey work here because uh, there's a lot that we can get, um, it, you know, in, in Daryl's uh, great work with kind of experiments and trying to unpack these beliefs and also the correlation of beliefs uh, at, at the individual level between how we perceive, uh, you know, generosity of insurance versus post disaster aid. Um, Etc. to see how people are kind of making these decisions and substituting across these options in their own mind. Um, and then in terms of kind of long-term risk, absolutely, I think uncertainty is a big piece of this. We, we try not to make a, a big statement as to what the correct belief is, but rather uh, it's, it's a well-known finding that there is significant heterogeneity in, in beliefs surrounding climate change. So, you know, to the extent that some people may be overestimating future risk, maybe overly pessimistic, uh, um, uh, that, that's entirely possible too as well. Um, but I think, you know, this really begets, again, more study looking at um, uh, climate beliefs, but also the learning process, um, spillovers in learning, um, how new information may or may not beget learning, uh, because uh, more and more we're seeing this heterogeneity can actually be a, uh, an important lever for um, how climate risk is, is uh, uh, propagated throughout the financial system. Yeah, I just think it's important to include the term confidence here. It's not just about beliefs, it's how confident they are in their beliefs. Yes, great point. Um, and then in terms of what people expect of government policy, you're you're right that you know when we quantify the overvaluation, we are really comparing sort of whether the expected damage is priced into the property values. And part of the reason they are not is because of you know the lack of information for households, um, which is also illustrated by Dario's experiment. Um, and that part of it could be you know rational expectation that the government is going to step in and provide all these aid. Although there are also research that shows that people in general are over optimistic about you know how much aid they're actually going to get from the government. Um, and for me, this sort of highlights uh, an additional thing, which is that policy uncertainties when it comes to you know future disaster aid provision uh, or the provision of but insurance at affordable rates, those kind of uncertainty can also uh, be part of the risk going forward. Uh, the NFIP has been on short-term reauthorization and, and they haven't been able to get like a long-term uh, reauthorization for it. These kind of uncertainties can become really big. And then, you know, in terms of risk rating 2.0, which is which is a new pricing scheme that that is see my attorney being sued, like all these uncertainties can add up. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talks. Um, apologies, I had to join kind of in the middle, so I, I missed, uh, Laura, your first talk. So my question will be focused a little bit on what I heard later on, but it actually ties in a bit to um, these comments on heterogeneity and, and beliefs and incompetence. But um, we, you talked about, um, Daryl, you talked about obviously your presentation was on the effect that providing flood risk information to um, housing market participants and home buyers, uh, what effect that can have on, on demand. And I'm curious um, if any of the presenters have thoughts on other avenues through which existing climate uh, risk information can have a big impact on um, this potential um, overvaluation or, or mispricing of, of particular assets. Um, obviously, Improving our understanding of risk is always a good thing, but um, given our, our current views and levels of understanding, I think housing market participants is a very clear area where increased access to that information um, can uh, 
result in, in more efficient markets. But I'm curious if, if you have thoughts on other, other avenues where we can kind of see a particular opportunity for um, a large impact simply by increasing access to, to risk information. That's for anybody, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I can take a first shot at this. Um, so there is a whole question about, you know, how people cognitively process information about risk. And sometimes, you know, large impact, small probability events, it's not that easy to understand for them. And so there's research looking at, you know, how you can convey that information. Uh, the other thing I think that might be more straightforward for people to understand is in terms of economic cost, you know, the cost of insurance and what is insurance, like how is insurance cost projected to increase over time, information about the future, those kinds of things is also important. Uh, although in the case of insurance in particular, there is a central dilemma, which is that if you increase the cost of insurance, people start dropping them. Um, and, you know, in general, we do want people to have insurance because it's really important source of financial resources for them to rebuild after disaster. Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't have a really good idea about this, but then I think that, you know, economic cost is definitely one of the easier to understand things for people. Yeah, so I, there's, there's a budding industry of climate projectors that sell like as detailed as possible climate data down to, um, you know, the uh, the lat long or the GOID. Uh, and their customers tend to be owners of big commercial real estate portfolios. So at least at the moment, those are the people who seem to care the most about this climate data. Um, I guess they believe that there's some, they, I mean, they, they're doing what this conference is about. They're trying to macro forecast um, what their portfolios are going to look like down the line. Um, so they, that's in a place where they're already looking at different information. And then, but another place that I think would be really important to get the information in front of people is, uh, is for municipalities, uh, state governments, uh, people who are making decisions also about investments in real estate, um, where to build a school, um, you know, whether where to build housing, whether to upzone. Uh, I guess this kind of goes back to housing, <laughs> but there are other there are other things to consider: transportation, just those kinds of um, urban planning investments. I think getting that in front of their eyes is a a good way to have a a large effect on the outcomes. Um, and I'll just add, um, a in addition to kind of information, so you know, through science scientists, through uh, public policy and whatnot, information. Um, disaster events themselves are a big learning tool as well. So I think that can be another useful area for inquiry um, to see how decisions may change following a disaster when uh, these climate risks may be a lot more salient. Um, there's a, certainly a temporal element, so people also forget over time. Um, but I have a, a working paper looking in Vietnam at how uh, households will actually change their allocations, change uh, uh, precautionary savings, and also the portfolio, what they're investing in uh, following um, cyclone events. So I think there, there are a lot of ways um, that, that this can um, interact with the economy um, that would then have implications for the broader macroeconomy. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so I, but certainly important area to be thinking about. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks. We have someone on an iPhone. I, there's no name attached to it. It's a, a 603 number. Um, could, could you identify yourself? Well, why don't we go to the next person, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Kaiser. Terrific. Thanks so much. Um, so, uh, hi, Beth Kaiser. I'm from the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, my question is focused on the perspective of the municipal fiscal authorities themselves. And so my question is really for any and all of the presenters. Um, it seems that there's a real tension here in uh, flood risk, climate risk generically in, in the context of um, building locations, insurance markets, individual homeowner decisions between 
uh, kind of the public policy need for what I understand to be called managed retreat, where municipalities, fiscal authorities will actually buy people out of their properties um, versus the municipality's desire for very big real estate tax revenues, uh, including revenues from new construction in very attractive areas that may have high flood risk or other risks that may not be priced in. How do you think this may play out over time um, in terms of both fiscal health uh, in the long run, municipal health for, fiscal health for, for municipalities, as well as allocative efficiency? Thanks. Uh, I can speak to this. I was I, a, a couple of years ago. I talked to the New Jersey League of Municipalities about our flood data, and it was interesting to listen to their conversation because they all had different incentives. Like there was a suburban community that was really worried about like property values, and then there was a more urban community that was worried about people um, being displaced and where they were going to put them. And there's a larger coordination problem between these communities because if you know, the suburban community does an upzone, it makes it harder for the more urban community to find places for um, their residents to relocate to if like a large stock of their housing is uninhabitable for a period of time. Um, and then there's also the coordination game between the municipalities and the state, and then also with the federal government in terms of how much they might expect to get and how to plan accordingly. Um, so yeah, a lot of political economy prisoner dilemma type problems that um, may ultimately be, be needed, need to be solved at the federal level, like some kind of, I don't know, incentives or uh, prescriptions for how municipality, municipalities have to uh, address these kinds of problems. Um, and I would add, so I have a recent study that looks at a uh, cultural barrier resources act, which is uh, a law passed in the 80s that definitely certain undeveloped areas uh, along the coast and take away uh, flood insurance provision and federal subsidies for development and uh, disaster aid. And in that study, we find that actually, so that policy is extremely effective in curbing development in those like very risky areas, but then they create spillover benefits for nearby areas that encourage development in nearby areas. Um, and they also provide flood benefits by conserving some of the natural land uh, along the coast. And so on that, we find that, you know, the, the revenue implications for local, local county governments that host these lands are not necessarily negative. Uh, and so one of the big takeaways that we get from that research is that, you know, proactive land use choice by local governments uh, that reduce the overall risk in the community and, and improve resilience might not necessarily be a negative thing for them uh, when it comes to adaptation. Thank you very much. And we have Bob Cobb. I'm going to ask you a lightning round question to round this up. Um, one of the themes I, I've heard emerging from a lot of the discussions um, over the last day and a half is that uh, for the United States, a lot of what we were talking about is relatively small um, at an aggregate national scale, um, but the distributional effects are are not. I you know we saw that for for transition in the previous session, we saw that broadly um, yesterday. Um, lightning round thoughts. What what do you think about how what you're talking about, which is certainly locally significant in coastal counties, uh, for example, um, could propagate up to something of national macroeconomic significance, or is there not a channel for that? Yeah, uh, one channel might be through migration. We've, we're already seeing people leave the coastal areas for riskier places, and home prices have gone up in places like Phoenix and Austin. Um, Florida, which all have high risk. So uh, even if it's, if one small area, people decide they don't want to live there anymore because of the climate risks or because of the way the government is addressing those risks and they are priced out or they are risked out, um, that would have spillover effects into surrounding communities and even across the country. Um, I'm thinking large scale withdrawals by insurers uh, could lead to, you know, systematic devaluation of properties in the highest risk areas. 
Yeah, I also think it's it's still an open question um, about um, you know seeing these as small risks. I I think that's an important area for future work. They may actually not be small. Um, so uh, the the first paper I talked about looking just at the uh, cycle and risk um, in this can have um, significant. I mean, it's not like you know uh, double digits percentages in in GDP growth, but we do find that that one single climate risk. Um, can lead to um, impacts both to GDP and welfare. Um, so, uh, it, but I also agree with uh, Penny and Daryl's responses. Um, all, you know, I, the mortgage market and, and, and uh, property uh, market, um, I think that's an easy place to start. We have great data there. And we know from the last great recession, how, you know, unanticipated risks within, um, you know, these, these, this segment of the financial market could lead to very large reverberations on, on a global scale. So I, again, I just, uh, I think this is an area where a lot more research is needed uh, to understand exactly that question, but, um, you know, thinking of them as kind of small or regional scale, um, may, may not be true. So. Yeah, I think Laura, you have a very good point. And just just to be clear, it's not just homes. Uh, in our floodplains, we've got a lot of infrastructure. We've seen uh, companies, electric companies, gas companies, others, lots of infrastructure. Uh, much of our nation's economic uh, engines of growth are located in floodplains that are very vulnerable to sea level rise. And now we've got wildfires as well. So I do think we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg uh, and there is more research needed to, um, to delve into the scale of the issue. It's obviously uh, buried in a number of budgets, including uh, a federal budget, which is why the GAO has that high risk list that they put out and, and flood insurance and crop insurance are always very much uh, on that high risk list. Um, so I guess one key takeaway does seem to be from this session that it's important for us all to know our risk, uh, whether we're homeowners, home buyers, managing these budgets, uh, et cetera. So just know that the risk shouldn't just be flying under the radar, um, quantifying it is going to be critical to making better economic decisions. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now. Thank you very much to all our panelists for a very, very engaging session. I'm going to turn it over uh, now to the uh, organizers to tell us a little bit about the work period that's coming up. Yeah, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, just like all the other sessions, we open the Slido again, um, but we are breaking for the next hour um, and we'll reconvene at 1 p.m. when we'll, we, we will um, go into breakout, uh, breakout rooms. So thank you, everyone. And yeah, definitely encourage you to add your ideas to this Slido. Um, just